and God bless. I'm Anthony Presley, and today we're talking about Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, which is about the Gog and Magog War. Why is this important right now? Because it has everything to do with what could be coming in our lifetime, maybe even as early as in the next few weeks around the world. Bible prophecy, or what's called eschatology. It's important for us to study eschatology. Eschatology is understanding what's going to happen at the end times, at the end times of the world. Did you know that the Bible speaks about in the Old Testament and the New, the end times very consistently? Uh, I have uh, some very respected writers and prophets that will tell you that the Bible speaks about the end times more than it speaks about any other event in history. This is very important that Jesus actually wants us to know what's coming so that we can be prepared. Even in Matthew 24, in Jesus' discourse, when he talks about things leading to the end times and the birth pains and wars and rumors of wars and that discourse that God gave, he actually said, make sure you're studying to show yourself approved. Make sure you're paying attention to the things that are going on so that you know when the time is coming. In other words, Jesus expects us to be aware of what's coming, what it means, and what that will lead to so that we can keep ourselves in preparation for his return. There's always been a concept of imminence in the Old and especially the New Testament of Jesus being able to return at any time. Well, the Bible shows that there were certain things that had to happen in advance. Many of those things have happened, including one major one, Israel becoming a nation again. So do you understand that Israel had not been a nation for 2,000 years? It was to the point where Bible prophets weren't even making that. They were saying that was metaphoric. They would never become a nation again, even though it's all in the Bible. At the end times, Israel will be a nation. Israel will be attacked. The entire end times are about and are surrounding Israel as a nation. They said that had to be metaphoric because it was that unlikely that Israel would gain territory again. Well, they did because the Bible and whatever the Bible says is exactly what's going to happen. Well, there are a few events that are left to happen. One in particular that may or may not be connected to the last seven year tribulation of the end times, the Gog and Magog War. I personally believe this most likely uh, will be a trigger to the end times or right before the end times, but many uh, notable scholars and many that I respect um, think it ha may happen during the, the end times. And when I say end times, I mean the final seven years on this earth. You need to uh, learn a little bit more about that, follow some of my other videos where I talk about like the Daniel 70 week prophecy and what that was. It was a week of years. So Daniel gave a set of years and he was able to count down. If you count those into days, the way that the uh, Hebrew calendar worked, you literally can count from uh, the point that Daniel uh, references all the way to Jesus' death. You can literally count the days and he was right on track. Well, in that same prophecy, he talks about a final week of years or a final seven year period after a gap from when Jesus died until the end times. There's a seven year period in which is the final destruction pretty much of the world. Thing chaos goes on, a uh, man named the Antichrist takes over, becomes a world dictator, and Satan rules the world through him until Jesus comes and sets up his throne on earth. That is the end of the world as we know it. This is called the study of eschatology, and that is about the apocalypse, the Armageddon, about the change of governments from man's government to God ruling and reigning on earth again. Well, leading up into that, there's another event that the Bible prophesies that's supposed to happen. And that, I believe, may be being alluded to in the news right now. And I want to make sure that we're aware of what's happening. It's in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's called the War of Gog and Magog. And for those of you that don't know, what that is, is a certain uh, territories that are going to attack Israel. And if you look at these territories, especially if you haven't heard of this before, this may be surprising to you, but the Bible predicts, and I'm going to read this to you today, that Russia, Iran, and Turkey are all going to attack Israel, and America is going to stay out of it. God himself is going to have to protect Israel. You ready? Let's dive in, because all of that seems to be setting up to where it, it, and there's never been a time in history that I can say that it was more likely that this could happen at any given time. Russia, Iran, they're getting together for the first time in history. They're setting up agreements and, um, and they're uh, purchasing materials from each other. They're becoming almost an alliance for the first time in history. And it's all setting up for what the Bible says is going to be the Gog and Magog War. 
Ezekiel chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I want to go over some of these lands. We're going to hear names like Gog and Magog and Meshach and Tubal. And you're like, well, who is that? And what are these people? Well, you have to find, study the Bible and study history so you can put people together. The Bible, you can go all the way back to Genesis 10, where it starts giving your lineage and you figure out who had what child and what people came out of those areas. And then you can take those people group names and compare it to history from uh, writers that are, are very commonly quoted, like uh, like Josephus, for example. Uh, Josephus uh, and Herodotus uh, all uh, are people that we can are able to quote and see that Gog and Magog, the Magog area, comes from what's called the Scythians. And the Scythians are the people that became the Russians. So Magog is your area of Russia. They were kind of in South Russia, maybe North Turkey area, but more of the Russian territory, which is why we know that Magog has to do with uh, Russia. Gog, being the leader of Magog, would be whoever Russia's leader is at that time that this war takes over. Now, and, uh, and again, right now that would be Putin. But what I want us to understand is the reason this is important right now is because the things that are being set up, how the agreements are looking, and how all these territories right now are in what could be a major conflict with Israel. Gog and Magog is actually a spiritual concept. It's not really just a physical person. For example, in the, um, uh, the book of Revelation, at the end, you're going to see that there's going to be another Gog and Magog war. Gog and Magog are going to come after um, Israel again at the end of a thousand year reign. So if it, Gog and Magog's here now, then how could they be here a thousand years from now? It's because of the spiritual concept. See, the Bible says that uh, Satan is the God of this world and he sets up principalities and rulers in high places. I'm putting some scriptures together to explain that what, what's going on here, that Satan has his own government over this world. And in his spiritual government, there are territories that have demonic influences in charge of those territories. And one of the powerful influences, one, one of the ones that are named in the Bible, is the spirit of Gog and Magog. Magog being the territory and Gog being that chief spirit. That chief spirit of Gog is going to go into a Russian leader. If this is happening as quickly as I think it may be, that very well may be Putin. Um, and then the spirit of Magog, which is a hatred towards Israel, comes over the people. And that's what happens here in Ezekiel 38. And you're actually going to see God break it down and allude to that, even to the point where they're going to realize at some point who they were in the Bible, because God is going to protect Israel. So it says, prophesy against Gog and Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And say to the uh, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaw, and I will bring thee forth, and all thy army, and horses and horsemen, and all of them that are clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company of buckler and shields, and them handling the swords. Now, I want you to understand a few things here. Number one, it says God's going to put a hook in their jaw. So somehow God is going to cause uh, the president of uh, Russia to have a hook in his jaw to drag him down into Israel. Something is going to catch his attention and drive him into Israel. Then what you're going to see as we continue on, he's going to say to himself in his heart, I'm going to get a spoil. In other words, he believes that he's going to become wealthy somehow because of going into Israel. So most likely it has to do with oil or something along those lines. Um, it could be, for example, that uh, Iran and, and uh, Israel actually go to war, and Russia takes Iran's side, saying, hey, we will pay ourselves back. This will all be worth it when we get the oil. Makes sense? All right. So continuing on. Uh, and then it goes on, and this talks about horses and armor and things like that. Now, I want you to understand that the words that are used here when it says horses and armor, because obviously uh, the Russians, unless something drastically that wrong goes wrong in the world. Uh, the Russians probably are coming with horses and they're probably not coming with swords. But the Bible translates that in the King James Version. However, the, the uh, original Hebrew word was not necessarily 
horses or swords. Now, back then when they wrote this, and even when they translated it, it made sense that they would translate that as horses and swords. For example, the word for horse here is sus. Sus actually means a leaper or something even that flies. It means something swift. It, it flies through the earth. And so they said leaping, fly, that sounds like a horse. They said horse. Back then, that would have made sense. Nowadays, it's probably more like a tank or maybe even a helicopter, something swiftly going through the earth, all right? And then the word they use for bow, you're going to see bow and arrow here. The word they use for bow was kishet. That actually means launcher. It doesn't actually say bow, but launcher, so it could be a missile launcher. Uh, arrow is katis, which means piercer. And there are actually words for arrow and words for bow, but Ezekiel was careful not to use those actual words. He used words that were then retranslated into what made sense when they were doing this translation. But he actually said, they're going to come with launchers, they're going to come with piercers, they're going to come on things that leap and fly. And for the word for sword is karev, which actually just means weapon that destroys. They're going to come with destructive weapons. So that's what the Bible is saying here. So when you see swords and horses, don't let that get you uh, bogged down or confused. It's talking about uh, artillery and weapons. It goes on to say Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, uh, the bands of Tagarma, and the North Corners and all his bands, and many people with these. So these are the people that are going to come with the Russians. Uh, you're going to uh, see one major theme here, and that's Persia. Persians are your Iranians. They still call themselves Persians to this day. They changed their name from Persia to Iran, I think it was 1935 or something like that. But they, they still call themselves Persians. I had a friend in college uh, who was from Iran. She called herself Persian. And so Persia is going to come. We know Ethiopia and Libya are going to get in on this war. But your main players, based on the names that we have here, are Turkey, uh, Russia, and Iran. It's a little bit of controversy over Turkey and uh, is it North Turkey? Is it this part of Turkey? Maybe it's possibly Germany based on where some people moved. But it seems more likely based on most scholars that uh, uh, studied the history of where these people came from. And looking at what's going on today, he's not using that as a uh, focal point of reference, but looking at what's going on today, we have Turkey that's already looking to set up a Kabul of uh, Muslims that are, are becoming increasingly against Israel. We have Iran that actively says, are we plan on blowing Israel off the map? If we ever get a nuke, we're going to blow them all up. We're going to blow them up no matter what. They call uh, America the big Satan and Israel the little Satan. They say they're going to destroy both Satans off the map. So they're, they're vocal about it. And then we have Russia. And Russia uh, right now is... Uh, they, and they used to seem to be fine with Israel, but they seem to be pulling away a bit. And they're definitely aligning themselves with Iran, setting up weapons deals, uh, setting up different trade agreements. They're uh, getting closer and closer with Iran. Now, Iran right now is very close to what's called what, uh, what is a nuclear missile. Um, you can actually see the headlines right now. The prime minister of uh, Israel. Uh, just a few weeks ago said Iran is 10 weeks away from a breakout point. He's, that means they're 10 weeks away, and that was a few weeks ago now, uh, from having enough material, enough nuclear material to make a bomb. And uh, uh, Israel has said very clearly, we will not allow Iran, the people who actually say by their religion that they are going to blow Israel off the map, we're not going to let them get this bomb. So at some point, what? Israel may have to attack or something. We don't know what's going to happen, but it could trigger something. Obviously, Iran will have a response. Russia may come in and decide that they want to uh, side with Iran, which is biblically what's going to happy, happen, and Turkey. And then they're going to bring in some other countries, Ethiopia, Libya. They're all going to attack Israel. And what's interesting is the Bible actually specifically says everybody else stays out of it. The people who are supposed to help Israel they stay out of it. America doesn't come in. And for the first time in history, based on the last few administrations, the Obama administration, the Biden administration, not Trump, Trump was very pro-Israel, but those two administrations for the first time have pulled away from Israel to the point where it's almost as if the, the support is not there. This is the first time I'm saying that we can see where America might say, uh, you know, we don't like it, but we're not going to put our resources into it. Israel, you have to fend for yourselves. And that's what happens at this time based on uh, biblical prophecy. Continuing on, it says, uh, verse 7, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, and for all thy company assembled before thee, a guard unto them. 
And it, it goes on in verse 8. It says, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. So again, the Bible is specifically saying this is towards the end time. Whenever it talks about latter years, latter days, it's talking about end time prophecy or around that time, which is where we believe we are in history. At the latter years, uh, the land that is brought back from the sword. So again, Israel's land was completely desolate for almost 2,000 years. Completely desolate. Mark Twain wrote about it and said this land that the Bible talks about is nothing but a desert. How could anything grow here? But the Bible says there was a prophecy that at the end of days, Israel would blossom like a rose. God would bring his people back into it. And when he did that, that the end would come. Well, guess what? Israel was blossoming like a rose. What used to be a desert is now one of the most lush and flourishing places on the planet. And it's not just flourishing physically, but the technology that's coming uh, is far superior and far faster than any people group should be able to produce. They're already significantly outproducing even America in technology and groundbreaking results and different things. Israel, I, I was reading a statistic and I don't remember the numbers, but there were something like 0.19% of the world that they had uh, 15 or 20 percent of the world's uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prizes. It's just an idea. Of, I'm trying to get you to understand the anointing that God has placed on that place to flourish so quickly. God says here, I'm going to bring them back from the sword. And when I bring them back, they're going to dwell safely. But while they're dwelling safely, then they're going to get attacked. Starting at verse 10, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall come to, uh, to pass at the same time shall all these things come to mind, and evil thought you shall think. He's talking to God here. He's saying, Putin, or whoever the president is at that time of, of Russia, an evil thought's going to come into your mind. Verse 11, it says, And you will say, I'll go to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest and then dwell safely, and all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey and to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. The places were desolate, but now it's inhabited. And upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods. And it says, I'm going to come to unwalled villages. There are areas in Israel that are absolutely walled. But there's a whole lot of areas that are not. And back when this was written, uh, it was crazy to think of a city that's supposed to be protected that doesn't have walls. But Israel has other protections, Iron Dome and things like that. But there's still an unwalled village, especially what Russia might consider. Russia might consider them small enough to where they're, they don't even con, uh, consider their weapons to be a threat. And so Russia is going to come in out militarily, from my understanding, from different sources that I have. Israel is actually probably the second or third strongest army in, in the world. And a lot of people don't realize that. America being number one, maybe China is number two. It could actually be Israel uh, because of the uh, leaps of technology they have and the secret weapons and technology that they have. That God has blessed them to be able to prosper in their mind and militarily to be able to protect themselves. And we'll see that, some of that uh, in this scripture. Even we can see nukes uh, in this scripture. Um, but continuing on, it says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. So Sheba and Dedan, that area is going to be uh, your United Kingdoms and Britain area. And the merchants of Tarshish uh, with all their young lions. Now, uh, we know that uh, Britain and the UK, or well, the UK, um, one of their main symbols is the lion. And so some people will say the young lions, this might be a reference to America, and maybe, I don't know. Uh, it really could be. It could be the only, one of the only references to America in the Bible. But here's the reference. It says, they're going to say, are you come to take a spoil? Has you gathered a company to take prey, to carry away silver and gold? So in other words, all the, it's just the people, the Britons and the United Kingdom and America, we're all going to say, you're just down there to get the oil, but we're not going to actually get involved. We're going to stay out of it, which is actually something that America typically does when Russia's involved. America, a lot of times, will decide to stay out of things. And so America, for some reason, is going to back away and not protect Israel at this point. We're just going to say, you came to take a sport. We'll, 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 we'll mention our disagreement and our disapproval. But that's as far as it goes. If we're going down to verse 16, it says, And thou shalt come 
against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. So a huge army is going to come. Uh, they're going to bring put together major armies. And it shall be in the latter days, so again, the end, end of time. I will bring against thee, against my land. I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I will be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. I'm doing this so that everybody in the world will recognize that I am God. You're going to come against Israel with a, a massive army so big it's going to be like they're covering the land and then I'm going to protect Israel myself and everybody will know oh God really is with that people that's the purpose of God allowing this to happen and so that the people themselves will learn uh, what the purpose is uh, and who he is see Israel still uh, many of them the non-messianic Jews still don't believe that Jesus is Lord and God says the point of the seven year tribulation at the end is to put Israel into, into this vexing, into this uh, pain, until they recognize that I am God. And that seems to be the same thing that God is saying here. I'm going to let the world, the heathens know that I am God. And then he goes on and says, I'm going to let Israel know through this that I am God, which is the same purpose of the seven-year tribulation, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people put this war in the seven-year tribulation. A lot of people think the war happens right after the seven-year tribulation begins. I personally think it happens right before it, and I'll show you where I got that uh, here in the Word. Go to the, the Ezekiel chapter 39. It's going to continue on. It says, Therefore, my son, prophesy against God and say against the Lord, uh, say against thee, the Lord is against thee. O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, I will turn thee back, but leave a sixth part of thee, and I will come up from the north parts and will bring thee into the mountains. So God's going to blow the, the enemies up. Somehow they're going to be destroyed to the point where only a sixth of them will survive. Verse 3, it says, I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of thy right. Again, remember the words here. It actually says, I will smite thy launchers out of your left hand and your piercers out of your right. So it could be launchers and missiles. It's, uh, we're going to verse 6. It says, And I will send fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Going down to verse 9. Uh, Ezekiel 39 verse 9 it says and they that dwell in cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons now, I want you to catch this both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staffs and the spears and they shall burn them with fire for seven years put a footnote there and that so that they shall take no wood out of the field neither cut down any uh, uh, out of the forest and they shall burn weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that have spoiled them and rob those that have robbed them, except the Lord. So the Bible says that whatever weapons were being coming against Israel, God's going to take those weapons and burn them for seven years for fuel to where they won't have to go and get their own fuel. They'll be able to use the weapons. To me, that sounds like a nuclear missile. Uh, so nuclear missiles. Uh, it sounds like uh, the things that make up <laughs> nuclear missiles work, uranium and things like that. They're going to be able to, I I'm guessing, if I were to guess, because it says seven years, if I were to guess, I would think that after uh, Israel strikes, uh, probably with nukes, uh, and then we're going to see some more, uh, more information on that in a second, but Israel strikes, Israel uh, takes out five-sixths of the army, and then as a peace agreement, they say, okay, we'll leave you alone, but you have to give us your nuclear weapons. And so then Israel takes the nuclear weapons, deconstructs them into just energy, and is able to use that to power uh, their city. And they have a seven-year maybe agreement on giving up nukes over a seven-year period in order for Israel to power their city. I don't know, but I do know that seven-year agreement is what begins the seven-year tribulation. And that scripture right there is the reason why I think maybe the Gog and Magog War could be what leads the end of this war could be the seven-year treaty that begins the seven-year tribulation. Because it says for seven years they're going to burn the weapons of the enemy. What other weapons can you burn for seven years for fuel other than nuclear um, uh, weapons. And if you're burning nuclear weapons for seven years, it most likely is a treaty, something that you've set up to where they're giving you nuclear material for the next seven years. While they're depowering their nuclear base, they're giving you uh, something to uh, power your city with. Uh, maybe they come up with a dual denuclearization agreement. I don't know. All I know is that's a possibility. It's here in the Bible. 
Continuing on, verse 11, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place in the graves. So Gog himself, the president of Israel, I mean Israel of uh, Russia at that time, will die in this war. I will give him a place in the graves in the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the, the noses of the passengers, and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the Israel be burying them that they may cleanse the land. So this is such a huge war. It takes seven months to bury the bodies. But catch this. It's going to keep going. The, uh, verse 13. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and I shall be to them renowned that day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out of men continuing employment, passing through the land to bury the passengers that remain. So, in other words, you're going to literally have people whose jobs, whose employment job, continuous job, is just to bury the remains. But go on and see what it says. It, it says that, uh, the, that, that when they bury them, they're going to bury them, but they're not going to touch the bodies. It says that when somebody finds a bone, it says they'll call for the experts, and the experts will come and bury the bones. What does that sound like? Radiation. Where does radiation come from? The end result of a nuclear blast. The uh, Bible here in Ezekiel 38 and 39 literally is predicting <laughs> nukes. It says the people will have full-time jobs just being able to deal with the bones of the people who had died up to seven months beforehand. And nobody will touch those bones, radiation. So God is going to um, protect Israel. And so it sounds like somehow a nuclear blast or several nuclear blasts will be a part of that. Verse 23 says, And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. And so I hid my face from them, so they fell by the sword. God's going to let everybody know, oh, the reason this happened to Israel is because they made their dad upset. However, he's still their daddy. And when you mess with them, God's coming for you. The heathen will realize this as well as Israel. They will understand that Israel is uh, God's chosen people. God is going to let the world know. And when does God let the world know elsewhere in the Bible that Israel is God's chosen people? In the last days, in the seven-year tribulation. All of this, for the first time in history, we're set up to where this can happen at any time. Russia, Iran, and Turkey are all together. They're all uh, putting together uh, their own agreements. And, uh, and America, for the first time, is backing away from Israel to where all of this can line up and happen at any given time. The Bible says, study eschatology. Know what's going to come at the end so that you can be prepared. This is important. This is the Word of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel chapter 38. I hope you've been blessed. You can find more videos. Just uh, type in Mystery of the Kingdom on YouTube. I'm Anthony Presley with Mystery of the Kingdom. God bless.